Now for our keynote speaker for this evening. He has presented credible, compelling UFO stories to the public since 1975, when he produced and wrote a documentary record album entitled UFOs, The Credibility Factor for CBS Incorporated. This was the first time that a major record company offered a UFO-related product via a TV infomercial. During production of his album, he and numerous law enforcement officers were involved in a historic UFO encounter in Lumberton, North Carolina, the first well-documented, multiple-witness, triangular-shaped UFO incident in America. In 1978, his second attempt at UFO disclosure took place on a world stage when he became the only person in history to produce a milestone presentation on UFOs at the United Nations. He brought together leading military and scientific experts who urged world leaders to establish an international UFO study committee. Between 78 and 86, he produced, wrote, and hosted nearly 1,500 local and national programs on NBC radio dealing with UFOs and unexplained phenomenon. Through his NBC features in 79, he renewed public awareness of the legendary 1947 Roswell, New, uh, U, uh, New Mexico UFO crash. In the middle of his NBC years, while researching Air Force microfilm files at the National Archives in Washington, D.C., he uncovered original audio tapes from a 1965 four-hour encounter experienced by numerous military personnel who watched nearly a dozen luminous UFOs maneuver in the sky above Edwards Air Force Base in California. He was the first person to bring this enigmatic case to the public in a 1982 edition of Omni Magazine. In 1993, he wrote and co-produced Lincoln's Music in America, The Classics in Space, a national award-winning classical music special broadcast over the Concert Music Network. This program, co-hosted by SETI founder and astronomer Frank Drake, focused on the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Between 2010 and 17, he was the chief Huffington Post writer of hundreds of stories that crossed the fields of the paranormal, UFOs, and science. During that time, in 2012, he was honored with the International UFO Congress Researcher of the Year Award. He was featured on the 2014 Sci-Fi Channel documentary, Aliens on the Moon, The Truth Exposed, and in 2015, he was a cast member on season two of the History Channel's series, Hangar One, The UFO Files. By the way, that's not what Walt Andrus's garage looked like, that building and then show, if you've seen that. <laughs> he is currently co-producing and co-writing the script for an upcoming thought-provoking documentary about UFOs, the third installment of filmmaker James Fox's acclaimed UFO films. Please join me in welcoming Lee Spiegel. <laughs> Thank you, Forrest. Thank you. Did I do all of that stuff? You oh, my God. You did all of that, and, you're, and you wow. wrote it down for me to read. Yeah, that's like a dad. fantasy. <laughs> Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me okay? Oh, great. Okay, I'm not going to need you for another two hours. Oh, what a great-looking crowd. I can, I, can, I can almost see you all. I want to do a, a quick evaluation. Uh, show of hands. How many believe... You have seen something in the skies, afternoon, daytime, at night, that you cannot explain. Let me see a show of hands. Oh, look at each other. Okay, how many of you reported it to anybody? Fewer hands. <laughs> uh, all right, how many of you didn't report it? Wow. I'm not going to ask you why, <laughs> um, but it's amazing. Uh, in this day and age, that, that so many people believe that they've seen something. Oh, how many of you had a camera at the time when you saw it? Good for you. I am I'm so happy to be here. Uh, and I have a really, really soft spot 
in my heart for this event because it goes all the way back to its early days when a man named Lucius Farish. Uh, have you heard the name Lucius Farish? Yes. Um, he was, Lou was, was the organizer, the host, and the backbone uh, of, of the conference for many years. But he did something else that had an enormous impact uh, on my life, and, and it, it affected my career. During my years between 1978 and 1986 at NBC, uh, people often ask me, why don't we know more about UFOs? Why, why don't we ever read about these things? Why are we not seeing anything about this on television or in our newspapers? Uh, why isn't there any kind of disclosure? That name, that, 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 that word disclosure has been floating around uh, for decades. Well, Lou Farish was a real pioneer uh, in those years when the internet was only just starting and, and people were hungry for information. And for $5 a month, anyone could learn a lot about UFOs and other weird, bizarre things by subscribing to the UFO news clipping service. Uh, just by reading all of the national and global newspaper accounts that Lou and his co-editor, Rod Dyke, uh, they painstakingly put together in a monthly 20 pages of legal size sheets. Uh, every, every month, on double-sided sheets as well. Every month, th this little manila envelope would arrive in my mailbox and, and I would eagerly pull it out and just start going through every, every sheet. Uh, of the stuff that they put together. There was a, the first section was all national UFO news, then it went into an international, and then it went into a foreign, uh, foreign and Fortean section, which was just all bizarre stuff. Non-UFOs, Bigfoot, uh, non-hairy creatures, things that fell from the sky, that things that just couldn't be identified, they stuck that in, in the final section. Every month, for five bucks, that, that became my Bible because when I started uh, at NBC in 1978, and I was there for eight years, there wasn't a lot of material. You couldn't go online because we had no online at, at that point. And, and so like Lou Farish and Rod Dyke, they made it possible for me to come up with some great stories to tell listeners about for years. Uh, it, was, it was always, always a feast of the eyes uh, from when this came in. And, and here's just a little bit of what it kind of looked like how many of you know about the UFO News Clipping Service and have ever subscribed to it? Well, it, it's, it, it's a legend, and, and I'm, I'm sad that it's not here anymore uh, because it offered so many different kinds of things uh, of what was going on. And in order to, to fit the stories on the different pages, you, you, you can see that they had to like bring some and, and put them on like upside down or sideways just, just to fill up the 20, the 20 pages of stuff. And I was always there like turning the pages and going this way and making sure I didn't miss anything. It was, it was, it was amazing uh, to go through all of that stuff. Uh, and the sketches, and these were all newspaper accounts. It wasn't stuff that, that Lou made up. He was just putting it out there and doing it at about the same time that he was doing the Ozark UFO conference. This was a very busy man. Uh, you, know, you, could, you could never get enough from this material. And it, it really, it preceded the, uh, the internet, the, the, the superhero, the superhero, <laughs> he was a superhero. It preceded the information highway uh, of, of the internet. So I wanna look at, at this whole idea of, of disclosure um, you know, like, what is disclosure? The Merriam-Webster Dictionary says it's the act of making something known, such as information. And, and very closely to it, the Cambridge English Dictionary, something that was not previously known. All right, very similar meanings, basically to reveal or uncover, as in to disclose a secret. Uh, I live in New York, and we, we have a very famous newspaper there called the New York Times. And uh, perhaps you've heard about it. On, on the front page of every day's edition uh, is their motto, which is all the news that's fit to print. Okay, all the news that's fit to print. So let's go back in time a little bit. 
to where early men and women on this planet didn't have newspapers to fill them in on things happening in the world around them. Uh, they had to rely on cave walls as their tapestry uh, on which to, to show things that they experienced in their lives. This is a 4,000 year old Australian Aboriginal spirit painting. You may notice that these extra large heads with the big eyes resemble some reports of strange beings that many people encounter today. Another, another area, another cave in Australia uh, that shows the ancient spirit paintings. It's interesting to wonder where the artists got their inspiration for these things. Now let's go to Africa. Here's an example of what's known as Sahara rock art. These are images that are carved or painted on natural rocks of the central Sahara Desert in Africa. This is one of thousands of such art dating back to around 1200 BC. Uh, if you notice above the odd-shaped helmet-like head on this figure, there seems to be a disc or a saucer-shaped object. Was that, was that deliberate? Was it a mistake of, of the artist? Uh, were these kinds of ancient art a form of disclosure? It, that will become even more clear to you. More ancient cave drawing. Early media reporters, uh, even they, they were reporters, even though they were living in, in caves, uh, they, they recorded what they saw, including things in the sky. Uh, things that very closely resemble modern day images, like this, of what people report today. I've often wondered if the New York Times borrowed their motto uh, of all the news that's, that's fit to print from these early cave dwellers, because for them, it, it was more likely all the news that's fit to paint. <laughs> you just re remove one letter and replace it with another. All the news that's fit to paint. Uh, again, was this an early form of disclosure? It depends on what and who you believe. Astronomer J. Allen Hynek, many of you may know that name. Uh, there's a very popular History Channel TV series now called Project Blue Book. Uh, and it, it records, it's recording, uh, or they're, they're creating, recreating some of the, uh, the best sequences or cases from the old Air Force Project Blue Book days from the 1940s into the 60s, uh, where the Air Force uh, was investigating UFOs. And Dr. Hynek, an astronomer from Northwestern University, he was hired by the Air Force to be the official spokesperson so that whenever there was a wave of sightings anywhere in the country that needed to be explained, they brought Hynek in. And I, I used to sit at home when I was a kid uh, watching press conferences where this, this man, Hynek, would show up with his pipe and his, and his goatee and he would destroy the microphone that he was wearing. Uh, <laughs> and he would always explain things away, but, but underneath it all, and which I would learn years later when we became friends, he was never very comfortable with doing what he was supposed to do. Uh, so he did this for more than 20 years uh, as part of the UFO study. And he used to say that people around the world weren't reporting pink flying elephants. Uh, they were reporting very consistent types of vehicles throughout history. Now, as we, as we continue to move forward through time, we will soon see how the whole idea of UFO disclosure comes into play here, especially with regard to the shapes of these remarkable objects. And we're going to start with this painting. Now, the, the, the timeline of recorded UFO history includes works of the Renaissance and medieval art, where strange circular objects showed up in the sky of many paintings. Here's a 15th century example called the Madonna and Child with infant Saint John the Baptist. There are many examples of this kind of art, yet the artist included something else in the painting that seems to defy logic. Now, before I zoom in on it, can you see it already? 
<coughs> okay, so let's, zooming in on the painting, and you'll see some sort of circular craft in the sky with, with rays or something coming out from underneath it. Skeptics or debunkers would say that these kinds of paintings included religious symbolism. Okay, well, but what, what is it symbolic of that makes a whole lot of sense to our modern day thought processes? If you look closely, I may need to use my pointer, you will see that the artist went out of his way to include a man and a dog. And even closer, the dog seems bedazzled by this thing <laughs> in the sky. Like, like, like really, I, I would have loved to have met the painter of this and say, first of all, did you see this thing in the sky yourself? And, and what's the deal with the guy and his dog? That's more fascinating to me. Did the UFO somehow take over the dog's consciousness? <laughs> uh, it, it's, was it actually something that the, that the artist saw? Or are we supposed to look at this and think that even the dog was affected by the symbolism? <laughs> <laughs> Were paintings like this some kind of or, or form of disclosure of the time? Again, it depends on whose interpretation that you believe. Sticking with the same time period, here's the Annunciation with St. Emidius, if I'm pronouncing it right, from 1486, created by Carlo Crivelli, and it's currently hanging in the National Gallery of London. It clearly shows, if you can see it yet, a disc-shaped object shining a, a thin beam of light onto the house and onto Mary. A closer view shows the object in the light beam a bit clearer. Uh, again, why, why would the artist include this as part of the imagery? Wasn't it enough to just create the building and Mary and everything else around it? But what's with this thing in the sky? Uh, was it disclosure? Here's another example. This time it's a painting from 1710 called The Baptism of Christ. While a group of people are gathered below on the ground, a large circular object is depicted above them, shooting down rays or beams of light supposedly uh, aimed at Christ. A close-up view only raises more questions. Why was this object, and the shape of it, why was it included in the painting? Was it a symbolic image of an angel, an angel of God? When it comes to UFO images of any kind and of any time period, it's important that you ask yourself, who do I believe? What information do I believe? I'm going to come back to this concept of, of a beam shooting down from a UFO in, in a few minutes. I'm going to move ahead in time to 1950, McMinnville, Oregon. Uh, two of those controversial UFO images were photographed by Paul and Evelyn Trent on their McMinnville, Oregon farm on May 11th of 1950. In this first shot, a circular object is clearly seen in the sky, and here's a close-up of it. Then the object shifted its position, and Trent snapped another image of it. And he, he got this shot. So let's zoom in on this one a little bit. These two images are widely considered to be the most famous UFO photos ever taken. And of course, because of that, they are the most hotly contested as well, because well, if, if only one of the hundreds of thousands of UFO photos that have ever been taken, if only one is the real thing, and by real thing, I'm not saying from another planet. I'm not saying interplanetary, interdimensional, inter other realities. I'm just saying the real thing, which means it is totally unexplainable to all experts who would analyze such things. If only one is, is the real thing, uh, not a fake, not a hoax, not the planet Venus, it's one of my favorites, it's not a conventional aircraft, it's not an optical illusion, and certainly not swamp gas. <laughs> if only one is, is truly 
un unidentified, then what explanation are we left with? So let's find an explanation. Uh, the official government UFO study group was known as the Condon Committee. It published, published its findings in 1968 and buried within the book, which pretty much debunked and explained away most UFO sightings. It said something totally different about the McMinnville photos I just showed you. And basically what the official government explanation was, this is one of the few reports in which all the factors investigated, geometric, psychological, physical, are consistent with the assertion that an extraordinary flying object, silvery, metallic, disc-shaped, tens of meters in diameter, and artificially, and evidently artificial, flew within sight of two eyewitnesses. That was from the original government conclusion. So what do we get from that? What do we take from that? Does that mean that this was an official form of disclosure in 1958? Depends on who you believe. It always comes down to that. On January 16th, 1958, a ship containing a member of the Brazilian Air Force, several scientists, and a group of explorers who was off the coast of Brazil near Trindade Island. They all reportedly spotted a strange object, and it made that sound. <laughs> I have proof of that. <laughs> uh, they spotted a strange object near, near the horizon. And, and if, you, if you ever have a chance to look at the original pictures, you can see something very far off over the water getting closer and closer and closer until it gets over the island. Can you see it like right there? OK. And it approached the island, and they noticed that it had what appeared to be a ring around it. like the planet Saturn. That's what it looks like. <laughs> <coughs> That's what I said. <laughs> um, so the, the object made a steep turn and, and moved away quickly. Uh, the images taken were eventually confirmed and released as authentic by the president of Brazil. Uh, skeptics and debunkers have come up with different stories to try and prove that the UFO was a hoax. But part of the problem was that there were, there were so many eyewitnesses uh, that so it remains a very compelling case. I'm fascinated by how it always seems that media, and I'm part of media, uh, media in general loves to make fun of all of this, uh, as though anybody who dares to tell what they saw or photographed, that they all had to be misinterpreting things in the sky or were down and out lying. In 1973, a wave of UFO sightings was reported all over the United States, which included uh, the famous sighting of Charlie Hickson and Calvin Parker. And Calvin is here to, to tell his story this weekend. Uh, and and this, this all caught my attention in 1973 for some reason. And so I started researching, I started reading as many books as I could get uh, on the subject, uh, and it eventually led me through contacts that I had in New York City to, to convince uh, CBS Incorporated in New York to give me the front money that I asked for and to let me go around the country and interview astronauts, government people, military pilots, commercial pilots, uh, people who, who know what they're talking about and who know what they've seen. And it, I produced a documentary vinyl record album. All right, show of hands. How many people remember vinyl records? <laughs> oh, you're all the same people who've seen strange things in the sky. <laughs> um, so so I, I produced this record album, UFOs, The Credibility Factor. CBS didn't like the title. They, they say, well, eh, credibility, what does that mean? I said, are you kidding? Credibility, that, that's what this is all about. That's what it always has to be about when it comes to UFOs. Well, that's the credibility factor. I said, oh my God, please just give me the money. <laughs> Let me go, you know. And, and then they didn't want me to, uh, to use this cover 
because this is the cover. I use that Trinidad Island photograph because I've always been fascinated by that. They wanted to use a cover that showed uh, pictures of what apparently was a cigar-shaped mothership from the days of Charles Adamski of the 50s. I think he'd, he'd been to Venus many times and come back. So he knew what the ships looked like. And there was a famous ship photo in, in silhouette that showed smaller ships near it. And they found that picture and they wanted to put it on UFOs a credibility factor. And I said, but there's no credibility there. There's more credibility, credibility in the shot I want to use. I can't prove anything about the Trindade Island shot, but it's better than George Adamski's. And so they eventually let me do that. And putting this album together, it marked the first time that the voices of military, uh, astronauts, government, science, and law enforcement people all came together and all spoke on a recording that was offered to the public, this was the first time, through a two-minute television infomercial. And this was 1975. Uh, and, and I was very, very happy about that. And one of the people who was on the album was Dr. J. Allen Hynek, uh, the former uh, scientific consultant to the Air Force. And he was really happy to get the album he wanted to promote it as much as he could through his Center for UFO Studies. And, and it just made my heart leap when he took such a, a, a liking to the material on the album. And not just because he was on the album, but he, he saw that I was trying to do something that was important. So um, while I was in the middle of, of putting this album together, I got a call from Dr. Hynek one day. And he said, um, I want to ask a favor of you. I'm getting calls from law enforcement officials, police officers, highway patrolmen, sheriffs, uh, down in Lumberton, North Carolina. They are seeing something strange in the sky there. They have for the last couple of days. They don't know how to explain it. I don't have anybody down there that can look into it. If you've got a few days, could you go down to Lumberton and check this out for me? and interview the, the police officers and send me a report. And if I think it's interesting and credible, I'll publish your report through the Center of UFO Studies. So I, I said to him, what exactly are they reporting? Uh, and he said, well, it's something here in 1975 that we haven't, we haven't come across yet. They, they are actually reporting um, a V-shaped object or a triangular-shaped object. Uh, that we haven't heard much about. And I, I said to him, okay, listen, uh, Alan, we're, we're friends now. Are you asking me to go to North Carolina and, and look into a flying Dorito? <laughs> and his, he, he said, listen, if you don't want to go, and then I said, stop. You are the last person in the world I want to piss off right now. I'm going. <laughs> And so down to, down to Lumberton, I went. And uh, I didn't know what to expect. And so this was the front page story that appeared on, on one of the uh, newspapers down there. And the next shot from the same newspaper, uh, UFO researcher declares sightings are valid. I was that researcher. And that's a picture of me with, with much too much hair at the time. <laughs> Uh, on the phone with Dr. Hynek, I was in the sheriff's department calling him and saying, well, Alan, there, there is something to this maybe, but I'm not sure you know, what, what else to make of it. Um, but I was immediately immersed in the investigation of it. And so uh, other stories came out uh, with sketches that had been made by the police officers from around the county. Uh, here's a close-up of, of that one. And, and here's another one. This one is, is, is close to what most of them saw. Uh, the sketch by a police officer indicated a large spotlight at the top with rows of lights on both sides of it uh, with one flashing red light. Now, while I was there at the sheriff's department, uh, the calls started coming in on the dispatcher. People were seeing the thing again. It was back. It was already nighttime. One of the sheriff's deputies grabbed me and said, let's go. 
and into the, into the cruiser we went, and we kept in touch with other officers from other stations and other counties through the car radios. And at one point, uh, we all converged in front of a large field, and we, we got out of the cars, and we were in front of the field, and directly in front of us, at the other side of the field, was a, a tree line, just a row of trees. And starting from, from our left, there was a, an alternating red light and white light, just back and forth, back and forth, moving slowly across the tops of the trees, and it stopped. Then it started moving slowly across the field in our direction. So, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I'm feeling pretty safe. I'm surrounded by six or seven officers with their six shooters. <laughs> just in case. And I'm thinking, wait, wait, just in case what? Because if whatever this thing is has decided to eat us and take us away somewhere where no one would ever know what happened to us, you can imagine what, what was going on in my mind. Later on, I, I, I drew my own illustration of what the thing looked like you know, from, from my vantage point. So my drawing was, was very close to some of the others. As it, as it came closer to us, slowly, it then stopped directly above us. So this was the vantage point that we had of it. And immediately we could tell it had no engine. There was no sound. It made no whooshing sound. No humming, nothing. It was just floating there. Um, and as we watched it, something else. Oh, and by the way, be, and later on, uh, just so you know, um, I contacted Pope Air Force Base near Fay Fayetteville, North Carolina. And they said that they had nothing, that they were testing in the skies that night uh, over Lumberton at the time. Now, the next thing I want to show you is, this is from a large painting created by a friend of mine. He's an illustrator named Dale Hendrickson that shows, that shows the most dramatic moment of this very close encounter. He, he did the painting. It's a very large painting that he brings around to conferences to, to show. Uh, it was based on my description and a description of one of the other uh, police officers who were with me. This beam of light came out of the thing. It went right down to the ground, right in front of me, and that's me. Um, and, you know, when something like that happens, it, it's really tough because it's hard to think when your heart is leaping out of its chest <laughs> to see something like that. And I had heard other stories about people. And remember when I showed you that, that picture of the, uh, the circular thing above above the Christ and they had beams of light coming down. Well, that's, that's what this kind of reminded me of. Uh, it stayed on the ground maybe two seconds, which seemed like much longer. Then it went right back into the craft. It turned slowly about 45 degrees, and then the whole thing turned an amber color. And it started pulsing, just amber, 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 like, oh, okay. And it started moving very slowly, as if to say, I'm done with you guys. I'm going to find some other locals and screw around with their heads now, too. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it did. And it, what turned out with this particular case, we, we didn't know it at the time. Uh, but this eventually became, this was the first multiple witness, well-documented case of a triangular UFO in America. It seemed like after 1975, we started hearing all about these triangles, and we still hear about them. And, and that, that whole thing about uh, the, the, uh, the research that came to, to realize that we were part of the first one, that was featured in a, an excellent 2013 book uh, called Triangular UFOs, an Estimate of the Situation by my friend David Mahler, who I think was here last year. Uh, if some of you were here and you remember. Um, also, as part of this, uh, it was interesting that when the UFO wave first started in Lumberton, a local official from the Federal Aviation Administration uh, said that people were probably looking at some Delta Wing experimental aircraft. 
well, okay, but I had already asked someone at Pope Air Force Base, and of course, if they were experimenting with something, do you think they were going to tell me? No, it was easier for them to say, no, we don't know what it was, you know, nothing more to see here. Uh, so then, the FAA official, then they, they changed their minds, and they wouldn't identify who made the original statement about that it had been an experimental aircraft. Uh, the, the, the Lumberton Triangle UFO remains unexplained. Uh, so w w was this UFO event a form of disclosure to you? Kind of depends on who you believe. And I will tell you another thing. When, when the Amber UFO left us, we, everybody got go back into the cars, and we kept following it as, as much as we could, staying in touch with each other through the car radios. And I found two police officers who had just seen the thing, and, and I said, well, what did you see? They said it came right up the road, and as it got to where we were, without stopping, without stopping on a dime, it did one of these 90 degree angle turn and shot off. Any human that we, that we know of in a craft like that would have been killed by that kind of maneuver, just the, the G-forces. So I, I did more interviews and was thanking them all because I knew that Dr. Heineck would want to see the interviews. So then somebody said, you ought to go up to so-and-so county and talk to a, a police chief Gary Moore. So I found the police chief and he was sitting in his, in his car, uh, the kind of guy that you wouldn't want to wa walk into even in an alley in New York City. He was so mean looking. So I, went up, I very carefully went up to his car and turned the window down. I think one of the other officers warned him on the car radio that I was coming to, to talk to him. So I, I said, well, what did you see, Chief? He said, well, I was just sitting in the car, and, and the whole inside of the car just lit up. And, and just like Richard Dreyfus did in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, he said, I just went over to the side, out of the window, and looked up and saw this thing parked in the sky right above my car. I said, okay, what did you do? He said, I got out of the car, opened up my trunk, pulled out my official, you know, official lamp or lantern that we use for emergencies on the highways at night. Uh, I aimed it up at the thing and I blinked at it once and it blinked back at me once. So I said, well, what else did you do? He said, I blinked at it twice and it blinked back twice. Again, it's like, did, did I see this or hear this in Close Encounters with the musical tones? Um, and that was it for that whole encounter. Uh, it, it was amazing to be there. Um, it, it was, you know, by the, time, by the time the thing left when we were still in the field, I didn't care that it wasn't a classic flying saucer because that's what I was really hoping for. I wanted to see one of the discs with a dome on the top, but this... This triangular thing, it did okay by me. It, it was, it's, it's never been explained, and, and, and I don't think it ever will. Next, in 1977, this was a couple of years after the UFO sighting and after I did the album in New York, I, I wanted to do something else. I wanted to see if I could take the idea of, of disclosure somewhere else where more people could hear about and get better news and information about UFOs, but not just in America. I thought, well, I'm in New York, the United Nations. That's the place to do it. And people said to me, oh, you, you, can't, you can't go there. They, they won't allow you there. Uh, you can't just walk up to the United Nations and knock on the door and say, hi, uh, my name's Lee Spiegel. Um, I recently had a UFO encounter in North Carolina, and could I come here and do a presentation? How fast would the United Nations Security Force be on my ass to, to, to get me off the property? So people said, if you want to do anything at the United Nations, you have to be either a delegate or, or delegated by a country that's interested in what you're doing and will want to sponsor your idea at the UN. So I didn't know anybody like that. Until 1977, uh, I, I started to, to notice how the prime minister of the little tiny Caribbean country of Grenada uh, was, was making some headlines. He was doing speeches at the UN, and he 
um, he was trying to get the United Nations to pay attention to his personal UFO crusade because there were, there were sightings in his country. He had seen a sighting, but nobody was really paying attention to him. His speeches, I noticed, were falling on a lot of deaf ears uh, at the UN and within the media. Media, media didn't, didn't care about him at all and hardly paid him any attention. But I saw just little pieces of, of things, not in the New York Times, all the news is fit to print. It's all the news is fit to paint, actually. Uh, so I hatched a, a little plan. I, I contacted the, the mission, the Grenada mission in New York, and spoke with one of their ambassadors and introduced myself and, and said that I had, uh, I had produced a record album for CBS about UFOs. And it's, it was very well received. And I would like to, uh, to give a copy of my album to your prime minister. May I come over to your mission and meet with you folks? They said, yeah, come on over. <laughs> you know, Grenada was looking for as much tourism <laughs> stuff as, as they could, any kind of publicity. So I met the, the, the ambassadors. We all became friendly. They took my album. They, they sent it down to, to Grenada. And uh, as it turned out, a, a few weeks later, they called and said, uh, the prime minister is going to be coming to New York shortly to be knighted to become Sir Eric Gary. And we'd like to invite you to the ceremony. I said, wow, do I have to wear a tie? <laughs> you know, I'd never been any place in the United Nations except the public cafeteria. <laughs> so I said, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to do it because they said the prime minister wanted to meet me and talk about my album. So yeah, I, I went, I was there, it was a great ceremony. Um, I, I couldn't imagine all the flags that were there parading through me, and finally when it was all over, and he was now Sir Eric, they brought us into a, a small room together, and we shook hands, and he said that he really enjoyed my album, uh, which by the way, if you're interested, I have an updated, limited edition, 40th anniversary CD package of my album that you can get from me here this weekend. It's out the other side of those doors. Um, so. The Prime Minister said, I, I, you have a lot of interesting people here. Uh, I don't know these people myself, but I, I know of them. Uh, what's your idea? So I just told him what I wanted to do. I, I, said, I, I, I said, with all due respect, Mr. Prime Minister, you're trying to get the United Nations to pay attention to you, and it's not listening to you. I could bring the people to the United Nations who the nations will listen to but I need someone to back my proposal, and frankly, you're the only game in town. And I, I kept saying to myself, don't, don't talk to him like that. that that's, it's, it's not good, it's not good. You, you don't know if you're gonna walk out of here alive by talking to him, but I figured I didn't care. He was either gonna say yes or no, and he said, yes, I would like to do this. I like these people, I want to get in touch with these people, I want to sponsor your proposal. And so over a handshake deal, we, we did it, we made it happen. And shortly after that meeting, a couple of things happened that, that were great. Uh, the, the, the first thing was that I got a letter from Grenada uh, that, that I could give out to people, basically saying that you know, we're going to be personally committed to the goal that you have, and we want to sponsor your proposal when the General Assembly reconvenes later this year. The next thing they gave me was, and I still have this, of course, my own delegation card. I didn't have to go knocking on the door anymore. I could just show my card, and I did a lot, and I could just, just glide through security and go to meetings and, and see people and gather documents. And it's like, when you have something like this, it's like, wow. I'm not even gonna try and sell this on eBay. <laughs> this, this, is, this is all mine. Um, so, and then, and then I started receiving checks from the, like the National Bank of Grenada. And, and what the checks were, were for my expenses, because I didn't want anybody, especially anybody in my own country, to know that an outside country was paying one of its citizens to do something about UFOs. I thought, I gotta be really careful about this. And so I made it very clear that I was not being employed by Grenada. That you, you could pay me as an advisor and, and I will give you complete uh, 
accounting of all the stuff that I would use the money for in, in traveling around the country and, and meeting people and gathering information, but I am not on your payroll. Um, I mean, I had people actually come up to me and say, if, if the prime minister ever invites you down to Grenada for a weekend, don't go. Uh, it, there were rumors back then that he had like a goon squad and, and, and people had disappeared if they didn't agree with the prime minister's beliefs on things. So I said, fine, Grenada is not my, my idea for a hotspot. But, but when Dr. Hynek learned that uh, how far I'd gotten now with Grenada, he immediately got on board and he, he sent me a letter telling me how much he wanted to be part of it. Uh, and you won't have to read the whole letter, but there are just a couple of quotes from it that he's always strongly urged that the United Nations provide some mechanism for the exchange of UFO information. Uh, I endorse your efforts. I hope to be present at the UN at that time. And, and, and that was great. Uh, so we, we, we formed a little partnership to work on this together. And the next thing that happened was on July 14th of 1978, where we had a, a closed door meeting at the United Nations. Uh, starting from the left and moving clockwise, uh, Gordon Cooper, one of America's first astronauts. Next to him, Jacques Vallée, astrophysicist. Uh, next to him, astrophysicist Claude Poher, who was the director and the creator of the official French UFO study group called the uh, JPAN, and they're still in existence. Uh, next to Claude Poher, Dr. Hynek. Next to Dr. Hynek, the Prime Minister. Next to the Prime Minister, and of course, sitting at the head of the table, Secretary General Kurt Waldheim. Uh, next to him, going around, uh, an almost hidden member of the Special Political Committee, next to him, with all the hair, yours truly. Uh, Jacques Vallée and I used to stare at each other across that table, kind of comparing our hair. <laughs> um, uh, next to me was a great, uh, uh, great researcher, investigator, author, Len Stringfield, and final was uh, psychologist David Saunders from the University of Chicago, who was once part of one of the government's um, committees to look into UFOs, and he was actually asked to leave the committee back in those days because he disagreed with the organizers of the committee because he didn't necessarily believe they were conducting good investigations. Uh, so what we did on this day, uh, it was during this meeting that we outlined our plan. Uh, and the Secretary General asked me, what are you planning to do here in my United Nations? And, and we, we passed out all of our proposal ideas and he gave us the blessings, said we should just keep in touch with his office. And, and that's all, basically, that's all we had to do to, to keep it flowing. I was, I was feeling so high at this point. Just being in this room with these people was, was amazing to me. Um, I couldn't believe my luck uh, after having done the album first and thinking I might want to do something at the UN and all of a sudden here I was doing it and it didn't seem that hard to do, which, which still amazes me all, all these years later. Now, part of this whole thing, it was about this time that I was invited to join Dr. Hynek and Dr. Vallée to go to Hollywood to meet with Steven Spielberg. Uh, this was seven months after the premiere of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Uh, Steven wanted to know if he could be of any help uh, to us in preparing for the UN presentation. Uh, and so he ended up uh, providing and supplying us with a variety of visual materials that were used uh, in the making of the movie uh, that we could show to the United Nations. Uh, for, <coughs> excuse me, for the next few months of 1978, all that I did was to gather as much material as I could that I was going to create an information pack that was going to be given to every country. It was going to be placed in front of where all the countries sit in the political committee room. And I was going to make enough of these packets to place them into the hands of all the media who were going to show up in November for the final presentation. 
So during one of my trips to, to Northwestern to, to work with Dr. Heineck, we were in his office and, and I said to him, you know, you spent 20 years as the consultant to the Air Force during Project Blue Book. I have to believe that while you were there, you, you came up with stuff that you got your hands on. That you must have seen anything that we could use that's better than some of the materials we already have. Do you have anything in your vast array of file cabinets here that I could consider a smoking gun about UFOs? He walked over to the file cabinet, pulled it out, pulled out like a little manila envelope, and he handed it to me and he said, I don't know if, if you would think that this is a smoking gun, but if you want, um, you can use it, you can make copies of it, and we can give it out uh, at the UN. And this is what he gave me. I started reading this. It was a 14-page, very lengthy chapter called Unidentified Flying Objects, but the chapter was part of a book called Introductory Space Science, Department of Physics at the United States Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs. This was 1968. And I started reading this, and, and, I, and I'm going through it over and over, and I said to Alan, how did you get this? He said, you, you don't need to know that, but it's been, it's been 10 years since the cadets had this. This was never meant for any eyes outside of, of the academy. Um, and he was, still get, he was still there while he was working with the Air Force on Project Blue Book. And I was just dumb, dumbfounded at what I read. And I'm going to give you some highlights of what was in this chapter. Uh, starting right here, we'll, we'll do, what we will do here is to present evidence that UFOs are a global phenomenon that's persisted for thousands of years. Wow. That's the Air Force telling its cadets, their future Air Force officers, UFO sightings not only appear to extend back 47,000 years through time, but are global in nature. One has the feeling this phenomenon deserves some sort of valid scientific investigation. I, I, would, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Uh, and I mean, really, I'm reading this stuff and I'm looking at Alan and I went, shit, are you kidding me? How did you get this? <laughs> and we can use this? The most stimulating theory for us is that the UFOs are material objects which are either manned or remote controlled by beings who are alien to this planet. There is some evidence supporting this viewpoint. I'm thinking, disclosure, disclosure, can anybody hear me? Uh, really, some evidence? This, and this goes against the grain of the idea that the government or the military has transparency when it comes to UFO information. There's more. Why no contact? We may be the object of intense sociological or psych psychological study. You don't contact a colony of ants, and humans may seem that way to any aliens. And I like this. Variation, a zoo is fun to visit, but you don't contact the lizards. This was better than my UFO encounter. I mean, I, I couldn't believe what I was reading. Such contact may have already taken place secretly and on a different plane of awareness. Again, this was not meant to be read by the public in 1968. There's more. The available data leaves us with the unpleasant possibility of alien visitors to our planet, or at least of alien-controlled UFOs. What questionable data there are suggest, suggest the existence of at least three and maybe four different groups of aliens, possibly at different stages of development. I was trying to imagine what it must have been like being a cadet, <laughs> reading this stuff in one of their physics books. It implies the existence of intelligent life on a majority of the planets in our solar system or a surprisingly strong interest in Earth by members of other solar systems. Duh. <laughs> uh, so this, this chapter appeared 
In the Air Force Academy physics textbook in 1968, a year later, the Air Force ended its long-term Project Blue Book in 69. And then this chapter was revised for, for further uh, books of the same subject matter. But the, and, you, and anybody now can go online now, and you can even see what the newer, better, later revisions were. But this was part of the original. Um, and remember, Project Blue Book concluded in 1969 that there was nothing of any scientific or military interest that was discovered in its examination of UFOs. And there would be no further need to look at the subject. So Dr. Heinick said, I could make a lot of copies of the UFO chapter that we could hand out to all the nations and the media uh, in November. This document, when you think about it, could, could it have been a great example totally behind the scenes, even though it was behind the scenes, of disclosure on some level, disclosure of some level. The, the military was disclosing this information. And some people might argue, well, it's all speculation. You know, they're not saying for sure that we know that some of these come from Alpha Centauri or the Pleiades. We don't know. <coughs> it certainly depends on who you believe. And uh, then that led to, in October of 78, uh, Eric Gehry uh, spoke at the United Nations and he told the world about the global consistency of UFO reports and he told the rest of the nations what we were gonna do in November. And, and he showed this slide as an example of what people were reporting from all over the world. Uh, finally, uh, the day arrived November 27, 1978, the speakers that I chose to present their views on the subject were Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who was up first. Following Dr. Hynek was astronomer Jacques Vallée. Always behind him, Hynek never had the pipe too far from his mouth. He loved smoking that pipe. Even in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, when Spielberg put a Heineck in the movie at the end, after the mothership comes down, uh, it, it lands behind Devil's Tower in Wyoming, and all the scientists are gathering around, and there's a shot that Spielberg did of just Dr. Heineck, the real Dr. Heineck, as one of the scientists, and he's walking forward and he stops, and he's stripping his beard, he puts the pipe in his mouth. <laughs> it's, it's in the movie. Um, and Jacques Vallée here, as many of you may know, he was the real-life scientist portrayed by Francois Truffaut in Close Encounters. And then we had Army Captain Larry Coyne. Uh, Larry Coyne was, the case of Larry Coyne in 1973 involved, he was the commander of a four-man uh, Army helicopter flying over Ohio. And they had an encounter that was terrifying. They first spotted a red light on the horizon, and they thought it was a radio tower beacon. But then the red light started getting closer and closer, and was moving very fast toward them. And, and they actually thought they had to brace for impact. They thought the thing was going to collide with the helicopter. And it got closer and closer. But instead of colliding, it stopped, moved above the helicopter, and just hovered above the helicopter, and then moved to go in front of the helicopter. And they were dumbfounded. A beam of light, a green beam of light, came out of the heli uh, out of the, uh, the craft, shined into the helicopter cockpit, bathing all their 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 gauges and controls in a green light. And because of how lit up everything was, on the inside and on the outside of the helicopter, they could then see that this was a, a totally cigar-shaped object. No wings, no horizontal or vertical stabilizers, no tail, just a very dark outline. And, and Commander Coyne thought he would try and pull the, push the helicopter downward to get out of the, the, the path or the, the beam, and they couldn't move because it was like a tractor beam. And he said, and, it, and he says it's on, on the album that I did, he said, we went from 1,700 feet to, uh, in, in, several thousand feet up, straight up in the air 
without, without stopping. The thing just lifted them up quickly, and then it released them with a bump, and the craft sped off. The helicopter landed at the, at the next army base, and Coyne radioed ahead and told his commanding officers, you better get some media out there because we're going to tell what happened to us. Because there were witnesses on the ground who saw this as well, uh, private citizens. So the army let them talk. And when it came time for me to figure out who I wanted to be at the United Nations, uh, I, I called Larry and I said, uh, do you want to come to the United Nations and tell the world your story? He said, yeah, um, but the thing is, you're going to have to get permission from my commanding officer in Ohio to release me, to let me go to the United Nations to do this. I said, all right, do you think that'll be a problem? He said, no, just, just call him and ask. So he gave me his commander's phone number, called the guy, explained what we were doing and how we would like to use uh, now Lieutenant Colonel Coyne at the United Nations. And his commanding officer said to me, again, my luck with, with all this stuff. He said to me, all right, we'll, we'll allow the, the colonel to go, but on one condition. And I went, okay, what, what's the condition? He said, he cannot appear in military outfit. He has to just wear civilian clothes. I said, really, that, that's it? Because I'll buy him three suits if I have to. <laughs> I just want him there. And, and they, they said he can go, but not in his army digs. So he came to New York, and uh, he came to the UN. And, uh, what, and then, oh, and during his testimony, it was so quiet in that room. They were so intensely listening to him tell his story because it was so credible. This was the morning session at the UN. And after he did this, we, we took a break, and we, uh, we went into uh, an adjourning room to have a press conference. And at the press conference, we had, from left to right, nuclear physicist Stan Friedman. I believe he's been here before. OK. Uh, next to him, yours truly, with my very proud three-piece brown velvet suit. <laughs> I don't know where that suit is now, and there's no way I could fit into it now. <laughs> that, was, that was so much fun. Uh, next to me was uh, the Grenada uh, Minister of Education, Wellington Friday. Prime Minister Eric Gehry next to him, followed by J. Allen Hynek, Jacques Vallée, and Larry Coyne. Uh, a motley group we were. Here's, here we are from a different angle. At the press conference, the Prime Minister took it over. He didn't really allow any of us to talk. It was like suddenly it was his ball game. And if you look really close, look at my eyes. I'm looking at him as if to say, shut the up. <laughs> but I, I didn't want any of his goons to meet me outside, <laughs> outside the room. So it's, it's OK. Um, following the press conference, the afternoon session uh, in the special political committee room featured Stan Friedman presenting his point of view on, uh, to, to the global audience that, that some UFOs, some, he believed, has always believed, are interplanetary spacecraft under intelligent control. Got to love Stan. Now, one of our participants who was at the earlier meeting in July, uh, Gordon Cooper, and I showed you the picture before, uh, he wasn't able to, to be there with us at the actual presentation in November. Uh, because he had some other business that he had to attend to. So, uh, so I asked him if he would write a letter offering his personal views on UFOs and to mention why astronauts don't like talking about them. And so he, he sent me a letter. Uh, you don't have to try and read it now. Uh, and I had him to address it to one of the ambassadors uh, at the mission of Grenada so that they could make copies of this and hand it out at the event in November, but uh, here are some excerpts from it, from Gordon's letter. Uh, my, my views on extraterrestrial visitors, he's already into it. They're extraterrestrial visitors, UFOs, what we should do to properly deal with them. I believe 
they're visiting this planet from other planets, which are obviously a little more technically advanced than we are here on Earth. We need to have a top-level coordinated program to scientifically, is that word, scientifically collect so that we can figure out how to best interface with these visitors in a friendly fashion. Because we're such a friendly species here on this planet. We, we should make, make sure we do it in a friendly way. We may first have to show them that we have learned to resolve our problems. Oh boy, Gordon, keep dreaming. Uh, by peaceful means, you know, rather than warfare. Before we're accepted as fully qualified universal team members into you know, the Starfleet Academy or the Starfleet Federation, essentially. Uh, and the, the other point, Let's see, you've got this. Right, he mentioned that in 1951, he had some occasion to, to observe many flights of groups of these objects that flew in formation uh, over Germany, where he was stationed at the time. Uh, they, they could never, our jets could never get high enough to reach these things. And he, then he said, most astronauts, very reluctant to even discuss UFOs because of so many people who have sold fake stories, forged documents, abusing their names. Uh, so we were able to at least get Gordon's participation in that. And, and then when the whole thing was over, well, I should tell you that, that the, the end result of that meeting was that while, while there were countries that were willing to at least consider forming a little investigation committee on UFOs, when the United States and the then Soviet Union vetoed it and said, no, we're not interested in this, that kind of blew the wind out of the sails. It was like it deflated the resolution where it, it still lies dormant. Anybody could go to the UN and try and resurrect it. I don't think I have the energy to try it again. Uh, but a after this whole thing happened in November, I, I started piecing together what I thought were my UN's sequence of events. And here they are. Uh, how it started with me, where I, I watched Eric Gary pitching the United Nations in 1977. Then I contacted the ambassadors, gave them my album, I met Gary, made a deal, met with Heineck and Valet and, and, and Spielberg. Then the July closed door meeting. Then the final meeting, the event, with, with the press conference. And, and then the United States and Soviet Union not responding favorably. And a year later, Eric Gary was ousted from power. Uh, and four years later, we invaded Grenada. And I remember uh, sitting at home one night watching the news that night when we invaded Grenada. And I thought, oh, geez, this is my, my responsibility. This is my fault. It must, it must be my fault, because I'm the one who started this whole chain of events. When everybody was happy with Gary in Grenada, and it ended up with him being ousted and us invading them, I mean, we had good reason to, uh, to invade them. We, we helped to restore a, a constitutional government there. But still, yeah, this was my fault. And I just wanted to stay in my apartment and never go out again. Uh, and it was, it was like a, a long thing. So again, disclosure, the bottom line was, all the effort that we did at the United Nations, was this a form of disclosure? I, I have to think that it was, just the fact that they allowed us to do this. They didn't have to, but we were allowed to do it. And, and I was very grateful to that. To, to this day, Jacques Vallée still says that that presentation that we put on uh, was a milestone, he believed, uh, a milestone event in ufology. I'm, I'm very grateful to that, for that. Uh, one of the nice things about the whole UFO event was that I became a feature writer for a new consumer science magazine back then called Omni. Do any of you remember Omni? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, soft spot in my heart for that too. Uh, and my first story uh, called uh, Gallery of Photographs was about the UN presentation. Uh, but there was one other amazing thing that happened as an offshoot of the UN presentation. Now, now, what I'm about to show you has rarely been seen in public. I apologize ahead of time. 
Uh, but I'm going to show you a picture of a real alien. I didn't want to tell you before, I didn't want to get your hopes up or, or ha have any of you leave because you didn't want to see something like this, but I just have to show it to you. Uh, and this is real. <clears throat> Ever seen anything like this before? When NBC Radio heard what I was doing at the United Nations, uh, they approached me and, and said, would you like to come on NBC and do nightly UFO reports? And I went, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and I said, now, do you want me to do this for free? Or, oh, no, no, we're going to pay you. OK, that's good. Uh, when would you like me to start? And they actually asked me to start by producing a, a complete series on the hour, every hour, on NBC Radio uh, for Hollywood. I'm sorry, not for Hollywood, for, for Halloween. Uh, they wanted me to do a, a bunch of reports to produce and write uh, reports of like the most bizarre things on planet Earth here on NBC Radio. So I did that just to kind of get my feet wet, writing and producing stuff. And then I started doing the, uh, the, the, the reports, the UFO reports. But before the first report went on the air, they said, look, there's just one thing we want to ask of you. Um, we, we, we're radio, it's NBC. We want to kind of keep this really fun as well as credible. And so we want to keep your identity your real identity a secret for about a year. And I said, well, what does that mean? How are you going to introduce me on the air? And the program director, who then later on, when he left NBC, went on to create a little thing called MTV. So you could almost tell where his head was. He said, I think we'd like to introduce you as the alien. And, and each night, we will introduce you as, and now it's time for the WNBC UFO reports with the alien. I said, okay, but, but because it's radio, and I know this from radio, most cities and towns all around the country when, when they have radio stations, uh, the public likes to have contact with their on, you know, with, with the on, not on camera, but on the, the on-radio personalities. They like the personalities to go out and meet and greet the public. You, know, you get to see the faces of the people that you hear on the radio. How are you going to do that? Are you going to send me out and meet the public and, and just blow the whole thing? No, he said, no, we're, we're going to give you a costume. So they sent me upstairs to the costume department of Saturday Night Live. And they created the, the mold. They made a mold of my head for this head. And, and it, 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 it was so awful to get into. Here's a picture of me getting into the costume. OK? Um, just terrifying to do it. And, and, then, and then on this particular occasion, uh, they basically they had a place for me to go. The first interplanetary disco back in the days when we had discos in New York, uh, hosted by the alien. And I had to go dressed like this um, to host this interplanetary disco. Here's a picture. This is a picture of me being escorted out of the NBC building in Rockefeller Plaza with two armed guards uh, because they had to protect me. And we had to walk up Avenue of the Americas past Radio City Music Hall. <laughs> Uh, stopping traffic to get me to the disco where I could dance the night away. Uh, but and people said to me, why, why are you agreeing to this? Isn't this going to screw up your credibility? And I said, no, no, because the deal that I made with, with NBC is I'll do this, but you've got to let me talk about and write about whatever I want on the air about UFOs, unexplained phenomena. They said, OK, but you've got to promise us you're not going to do or say anything that will bring any kind of liability or suits at us. I said, yeah, I can, I can do that because I'm a credible guy. So let's see what the suit looks like. <laughs> and so this is what this, I don't know if you can see it easy, but on my chest it says WNBC. Uh, so that, that was my, my alien days. I did that just, just for a year. 
And, and it was during the first, my first year at NBC, Stan Friedman called. This was 1978. And he called to tell me about something that he had stumbled onto uh, involving military people who were involved with an event that the public didn't know much about in 1978. And it was something that took place in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this particular front page and the headline uh, from 1947. Stan told me he had met this guy, Major Jesse Marcel, who had been one of the officers who had been sent out to the crash site of whatever it is that crashed outside of Roswell in 1947. And he was supposed to pick up as many of the pieces as he could and bring them back to the base for analysis. And Stan said, would you like to talk to this guy, Marcel? Because he hasn't done many interviews. And if I tell him that we're friends, I think he'll talk to you. And I said, sure. And do you think he can line me up with other people who might have been at Roswell in 47 that I can talk to as well? And Stan said, sure. And I interviewed Marcel. And he, he turned me on to one guy who was one of the, the flight engineers um, who was out on the tarmac lifting up pieces, large pieces that were hidden underneath some kind of covering. So he couldn't see what the canvas was holding or hiding underneath it. But he said, well, I can't lift this up myself. It looks too big. And one of the other guys said, don't worry, not a problem. And he said he, went, he reached for it, and it was as light as a feather, whatever the metal was that was under the canvas. He hoisted it into a bomber where they were going to fly it to another Air Force base. Um, and so th this all started out, the, this famous headline that you see, it started the whole media frenzy back on July 8th, and, and I'm thinking, disclosure. I mean, they, the, it was the military uh, that told the public information officer at, at Roswell, we want you to print this, that we've captured a flying saucer. Is that not disclosure? Um, until certainly the next day, when now it was a weather balloon. I, you know, I said, oh, disclosure comes and disclosure goes. They changed the story from a flying saucer to a weather balloon, and off went, off everybody went, into years of speculation and debate over what really happened in Roswell. Uh, in 1979, when I interviewed Colonel Marcel and others, uh, he, he said to me, and he said to other people at the time also, that the, the pieces of the object that he brought back uh, to Roswell were things, uh, well, in fact, let me just show you this to give you an idea. Uh, Marcel said the material that he, that he was photographed here posing with was not what he had brought back from the actual UFO crash. He, he also said that the real stuff couldn't be damaged in any way. They couldn't burn it. Uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't dent it with a sledgehammer. Uh, some of the, the smaller pieces of it that they could fold up in their hands would just suddenly come back to its original shape. And, he, and, and until he died, Marcel maintained that, in his opinion, it could not have been manufactured on Earth. Again, what, was this an early form of disclosure? I think so, but it kind of depends on, again, who you believe. Something else happened in 1947. That's all about possible early evidence of disclosure. When flying saucer reports flourished in that year, 47. Air Force Lieutenant General Nathan Twining, he was the commander of the Air Material Command, and he would later serve as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He issued an eye-opening memo on September 23rd to Brigadier General George Shulgin of the Army Air Forces. The subject line of the memo stated, the AMC opinion concerning flying disks. Now, so that you don't have to try and, and read what's there, I'm going to make it easy for you. Here are, the, here are the highlights of the Twining memo. It's the opinion that the phenomenon reported is something real, not visionary or fictitious. This is 1947. There are objects probably approximating the shape of a disk of such size as to appear to be as large as man-made aircraft. The possibility is some of the incidents may be caused by natural phenomena, such as meteors. And that's fine. I would go along with that. But the majority of things can be explained. But we're narrowing it down to the things that can't be. 
the reported operating characteristics, extreme rates of climb, maneuverability, action that must be considered evasive when sighted or contacted by friendly air, aircraft or radar. These lend belief to the possibility some of the objects are controlled either manually, automatically, or remotely. And that's, that's very similar to, to the language years later that the Air Force was telling their cadets about UFOs. Uh, so what happened was the th this memo, the Twining memo, eventually led to an official study of these flying disks. It was called Project Sign, and then it later became Project Grudge, and then morphed into the more well-known Project Blue Book. But as I like to point out, to me, the original Twining memo was clearly an instance of disclosure, but it, it depends on who you believe. So now we come to this man, a very politically connected individual, John Podesta. He's been, he's been an outspoken advocate for UFO disclosure for many years. And the, he was a former White House chief of staff under Bill Clinton. Uh, Podesta later became a special counselor to President Obama until 2015. Podesta has gone on record many times uh, urging the United, the United States government to come clean on UFO information. And he says it's been holding back from the public. Here are some quotes from John Podesta over the years. It's time to open the books on questions that have remained in the dark about the government investigations of UFOs. It's time to find out what the truth really is that's out there. Uh, I'm skeptical about the notion that the government always knows best and that the people can't be trusted with the truth. The time to pull the curtain back on the subject is long overdue. Uh, it, I mean, it looks, like, it looks like Podesta had UFO disclosure in mind when he made statements like that. It's also pretty well known that Podesta's former boss, Bill Clinton, has hinted that when he was commander in chief, he made some inquiries into possible secret UFO information, uh, but that nothing ever came from that effort. Um, but what's really interesting, and you can find this on the internet very easily, now that there is an internet, in 2005, Clinton was in the middle of a speech in Hong Kong when someone in the audience asked about his interest in UFOs. And this is how he responded. It's, it's a great quote. I did attempt to find out if there were any secret government documents that reveal things, and if there were, they were concealed from me too. I wouldn't be the first president that underlings have lied to or that career bureaucrats have waited out but there may be some career person sitting around somewhere hiding these dark secrets, even from elected presidents. But if so, they successfully eluded me, and I'm almost embarrassed to tell you, I did try to find out. I, wow, when he said that he wouldn't be the first president that underlings have lied to, or that bureaucrats have waited out, that, that implies the idea that, that he didn't have a need to know or high enough security clearance and, and that uh, they just had to wait him out until he left office, until the next person came in and they would do it all over again with the next person. Uh, it certainly implies the possibility that information about UFOs is kept away from elected presidents, as, as he said here. It also suggests, really, that the presidents of the United States don't have a high enough security clearance or need to know about this information, if that's true, then certainly the public, all of us in this room, we don't have that right to know either, if, if the president doesn't. Who, who exactly is in charge of all of this? Um, was Clinton's statements a form of disclosure? Sounds like it to me. Um, Depends on who you believe, especially whether or not you, you believe him or not. Now, here's, here's a little bit more about Mr. Podesta. Uh, speaking of the Clintons, 
John Podesta and, and Barack Obama, okay, when Podesta finished his year of being Obama's special advisor, he tweeted, maybe you saw this on the news at the time, he tweeted about his biggest regret at that point having worked with Obama. And what he did was, and here's the actual tweet, uh, finally my biggest failure of 2014, once again not securing the disclosure of the UFO files. I think that tweet alone was a form of disclosure from Podesta. Uh, here are a few more quotes from Podesta on, on UFOs where, where he had previously said that it's time to find out what the truth really is. Uh, we ought to do it, it's right. We ought to do it because the American people can handle the truth. We ought to do it because it's the law. These are all from a guy who was the former White House Chief of Staff. I mean, he's, he's, he's no underling. And, and he was, he's very highly respected um, because it's the law. So during the, uh, during the 2016 presidential election race, after Podesta convinced Hillary Clinton to look into the UFO issue, she made several statements to the media about how if elected president, uh, she would declassify as many UFO files as possible and share it with the public. Well. Well, we all know she didn't move back into the White House. Uh, and the UFO issue was still up for grabs. It sort of feels like the whole Bill and Hillary Clinton, John Podesta UFO remarks were strong candidates for disclosure. But it depends on who you believe. It, it, it certainly does come down to that. Now, the most recent and big UFO disclosure event was certainly a front page story on the New York Times back in December of 2017. It revealed how the Pentagon had been investigating unidentified flying objects for years. And insiders say it's ongoing. And some military people that I've interviewed have said, yeah, the same thing. There are many agencies within the government, especially in the military, they've been, they, they, they never stopped investigating UFOs because they don't know what exactly some of these more weird things are. So again, this, this flies in the face of the previous military denials that there, was in, that there wasn't anything of interest about UFOs. Now this screen grab that you see comes from one of the films released by the Pentagon. It shows one of the encounters between an unknown object and some jet fighters. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in on it just a little bit. There are rumors that the government or military will release more films like this in the future. I call that disclosure, because as, when you watch the actual film, and you can find these very easily, um, this thing, they call this uh, a gimbal. They called another one a tic-tac, because it looked like a tic-tac. But this one, you, you could see it in the film, moving around, turning, changing its shape a little bit, and, and the jet fighters couldn't get any, any closer to it. Um, it. It's just amazing what they even allowed to be released to the public, and on the pages of the New York Times. One of the, one of the authors of the New York Times piece, my friend Leslie Kane, she told us that it took the New York Times editorial division uh, more than three months to agree to let her be a co-author and to let the story even be written before the Times decided, yeah, you've got enough evidence here that we'll put it on the front pages of the Times. And then every single sentence, a word, in that story had to be vetted, had to be analyzed by the editorial staff of the Times before it was released. Uh, in December of 2017. Uh, now, if, if they reveal more films like this, I think it's disclosure because they will be disclosing the whole, the whole uh, what, what disclosure means. You know, it's, it's to reveal something that is not known. Okay, so to show more films means that they're going to disclose something. It may not be the kind of disclosure that reveals everything that our leaders know about these objects. But it's finally, I think, a good place to start. <clears throat> Whether you believe that some UFOs may, in fact, be from another planet, uh, or dimension, or if it's all one big hoax, uh, and that every single UFO report and photograph and video 
can be explained. Uh, one, one thing is certain, we, we live on a planet, and I'm sure you know this, we live on a planet that's in what is known as the Goldilocks zone. Do you know what that is? The, the Goldilocks zone uh, is an area at, at just the right distance so that if a planet is at just the right distance from its home sun, that it can inhabit life. But the odds of that happening might seem small, but in, in a universe of billions and billions of galaxies, and you're going to hear some numbers here. Uh, in recent years, data from the Kepler spacecraft has confirmed the discovery of Earth-sized planets in orbit around many other suns very far away from our solar system. Uh, the Kepler spacecraft was launched in 2009, and it's a space telescope that was designed, it was designed to discover Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. So far, Kepler has found more than 5,000 5, possible planets, with 2,500 confirmed by the data that it sent back to scientists on Earth. I'm not saying that they all look like this. <laughs> this is just an illustration of what a lot of planets could look like if they were so close to each other. Kepler has, has shown us uh, hundreds of other possible Earth-like worlds out there. And we should remember that, that our sun is, is merely one out of billions of suns. I don't like to use the word stars. They are suns in the Milky Way galaxy. We don't know whether or not Earthlings could live on one of these planets. But you're, you're looking at the uh, suns now because the planets are so far away, we can't actually see them yet. Uh, we, we only know that the possibility of life elsewhere is growing every day. Uh, a, couple, a couple of years ago, Time Magazine included three planet hunters on its annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. One of those scientists is, is named Natalie Batalha. She's with NASA's Ames Research Center uh, in California. And she was the first woman at NASA to make it to Time's list of 100 most influential people. She's also the project scientist for the Kepler spacecraft mission. Batalha wrote, uh, actually she said in an interview that no matter where you live or travel to, chances are pretty good that at night you'll be able to see at least a couple of stars or suns in the galaxy or in the, in the sky. Uh, but these exoplanet discoveries are really changing how we see the universe. And I love the, this, this next quote. I love telling people this. You know, she said, we look up in the sky and instead of seeing stars, we see other solar systems. Because now we know, this is an amazing statement, now we know that every star in the sky has at least one planet. That's amazing. That, that's staggering. Bec but the statistics apparently point in that direction. Um, no matter where you live uh, or go to, chances might be good that at night you, you may be able to see, uh, you may be fortunate enough to see like the, the stars of, of the Milky Way uh, streaking across the sky, depending on how dark the night is and how the sky is. Uh, our home galaxy uh, is among the billions or trillions of galaxies in the known universe. And you get to see exactly what Natalia uh, Batalha and other scientists are talking about. This whole, this whole concept of in, infinite numbers of stars that have planets orbiting them. I, I think the concept of every star in the heavens possibly having at least one planet uh, is staggering. Now, have you seen this in the last couple of days? Uh, there's always been speculation that if some UFOs are extraterrestrial or extraterrestrial travelers, perhaps they get around the galaxy 
by moving in and out of and flying into and out of wormholes or black holes in space. Two days ago, two days ago, scientists made an announcement and revealed they have captured the first image of an actual black hole. This is what it looks like. It took many years of, of international effort to achieve this, this image. Hey, get a closer look at it. Um, this is an amazing discovery. Uh, and I, I highly recommend that, that you attend astronomer Mark D'Antonio's presentation tomorrow afternoon to hear more about this uh, and the implications that, that this brings to us, a black hole and all that that means. Uh, in, in the end, and what you're looking at now, you, you might think in, instantly, oh, look at all those stars. No, there is nothing in this photograph that is an individual star. You are looking at uh, a photograph of deep space. Every single object you see here is a galaxy. And this is a very little section of the sky. This is not like a vast portion. If you went in every direction from, it would be more and more and more. That's why they, they come out with these statistical numbers of how many, how many galaxies are on, therefore how many planets that there might be out there. These are galaxies. Uh, I think if you take the time and actually maneuver your way through all the noise, uh, the conspiracy theories, uh, the doubts, the hoaxes, the nitpicking, and uh, the debunking that, that always surrounds the UFO topic, you, you will find a lot of reason to believe that disclosure has, in fact, already occurred. I've been studying this stuff for more than 40 years. I can't prove anything, but, but I, I know that there's enough evidence on some level to prove, to prove that we're not alone. Um, and I believe that disclosure has, has happened. All we have to do now is, is figure out how to deal with the implications that it has for the citizens of planet Earth. Thank you so much.